Our next speaker is Peter Galbraith from the United States of America. I'm very, very happy to get to introduce Peter. He served as the first US ambassador to Croatia. Um, you have held other senior government positions, including Deputy Special Representative of the Secretary General of the United Nations to Afghanistan in 2009. Um, you are also an, uh, an author, and um, I believe that you have actually been pivotal in helping 17 children to be repatriated from the camps in uh, Syria. So, very warm welcome to you, Peter. The floor is yours. Well, so thank you uh, for the invitation and um, my particular uh, congratulations and appreciation to repatriate the children, Denmark, and to Newt and Natasha, uh, and all the volunteers for the extraordinary work they've done, which is not just uh, in highlighting this issue and, of course, in uh, putting on this conference, but in achieving uh, a significant part of their goal by having the government of Denmark now commit to the repatriation, well, in fact, it's committed to the repatriation of all the Danish children, three of the mothers. Uh, there are some complications about the children of people who are no longer Danish citizens, but still, uh, it is a, a great success. Uh, the subject of this conference is the plight of some, of, of some 5,000 foreign meaning not Iraqi or Syrian, children being held in two Kurdish-run detention camps in northeast Syria. And frankly, the more specific focus of this uh, conference is the fewer than 1,000 children born to women from Western countries, Europe, Australia, Canada, uh, and the uh, Americas. But before I turn to the specific subject, of these 5,000 or 1,000, I want to just emphasize a point that this represents only a small fraction of the human misery that is going on in Northeast Syria. 10,000 Kurdish men and women fighters died in Northeast Syria in the six-year war against the Islamic State. Those deaths mean thousands of Kurdish and other children growing up as orphans or with just one parent. Thousands of Kurdish civilians, including children, died in the Islamic State's brutal assault on Kobani and other towns. Prisoners were beheaded, drowned, burned alive, and the case of some women stoned to death, that creating more orphans. Tens of thousands of Kurdish and Christian families were driven from their homes by the Islamic State, and by the Turkish invasion of Afrin in 2017 and of Northeast Syria in 2019. In many cases, the homes in the areas taken over by ISIS no longer exist, and where the Turkish troops are or their proxies, return is not possible. You saw the video of the misery in the camps, but understand that is just part of the misery. There are people who are the victims of the Islamic State who are in terrible conditions. So when we think about children in Northeast Syria, it is not just those children who happen to come from European countries. There's a group of victims that is near and dear to my heart. You mentioned uh, 17 children repatriated uh, that I was involved in. But 12 of those children uh, were children of young women who were kidnapped in Sinjar in north, northwest Iraq in 2014, taken by the Islamic State, sold, literally sold in public auctions as sex slaves, raped, and uh, had children. And uh, then what happened? 
They were with the Islamic State as slaves until Barghouz fell in 2019. They went with the, um, uh, with, with the ISIS families. They, they to, were taken, captured by the Kurds. If the woman identified herself as a, as a Yazidi, she was immediately taken away from the group, turned over to the Yazidi religious establishment, which took her children away. And the religious establishment went through the camps looking for Yazidi women, some of whom didn't identify themselves because they knew they'd lose their children. Where they were found, that was the same situation. The children went to an orphanage in northeast Syria. These young women, uh, they, uh, teenagers, uh, when they were abducted, went back to Iraq, and they were denied for more than two years the right for their, to get their children. So I hope you can recognize the irony of this situation, that the women who went to Syria to participate in a terrorist organization that enslaved the Yazidis, they got to keep their children in the camps. Whereas the people who were enslaved uh, were, had their children taken away. Uh, fortunately, we were able to reunite some of them there's still more to be reunited, and I have to pay tribute to a Swedish Kurdish doctor, doc, Dr. Naaman Ghafouri, uh, who found the Yazidi mothers, and even though they, she was not able to participate in the actual physical repatriation uh, on the Syrian side of the border, um, they only allowed me to do that. And she was, it was without her, none of this would have been possible. Um, so I, I, I tell of this just to say, that um, what we're talking about here is a small drop in the bucket of, of the human misery. But of course, the fact that uh, ISIS, ISIS had created so many victims is no reason not to help the children of the women who joined ISIS because they too are completely innocent and they deserve a better life than what was depicted in that video. So what is the status of the European and Western children who are now in Northeast Syria? And I might add, uh, I've been going to Northeast Syria since 2014. I think I've made 18 trips. And uh, uh, the, the Syrian Kurds had asked me, and Bernard Kushner, the founder of Doctors Without Borders and former French foreign minister, to, deal with, to start to look at this problem even before Barghouz fell. The moment the children are held in, in two prisons, and uh, uh, we need to use the right terminology here. Raj and al Hol are prisons, not camps. And I, I appreciate the fact that in your film, you described it correctly that way. The word camps somehow suggests that the, uh, the children and their mothers are refugees, which they are not. The foreign mothers, the European mothers, Western mothers, are almost without exception women who committed the crime of traveling to Syria for the express purpose of joining ISIS, a known terrorist organization which recruited people with videos of beheading journalists, uh, burning pilots, throwing homosexuals off tall buildings, stoning women, and other heinous crimes. Some of these women committed a crime of endangering their children by bringing them into a war zone. A crime that raises a question of how could they be fit mothers. Others participated uh, in the uh, ISIS morality police, in the acts of persecution. Some recruited suicide bombers. Some made bombs. Some executed prisoners. Some assisted in the enslavement and rape of the Yazidi girls and women and some fought for the terrorists. But I will say, most of the women, their most serious crime was simply going to join ISIS. And I don't want to say that this is different from the Syrian and Iraqi women, many of whom did not choose to join ISIS. But the foreign women all made that decision to go there. Uh, some were duped. Uh, there's an element of trafficking with some of the younger women, like Shamima Begum, the famous case, 15 years old, but basically, there, these were people who made the choice. The second point is, all the crimes 
were committed in Syria. And as a matter of law, the appropriate place to try someone is the jurisdiction where they committed the crime. That's where the evidence is. Uh, the Kurdish administration in northeast Syria, however, has said it's not equipped to hold tries, trials, and at various times have asked countries to take back their citizens or to hold international trials. Why international trials? Because they feel that there should be a, an accounting before the world of the crimes of the Islamic State and for their own people. At this point, two, two and a half years later, they're now also considering local trials. Meanwhile, the women and children are held in prisons, fenced and guarded, guarded from which they cannot leave, as you can see in the uh, video, and subject to many of the usual rules which you would have in a prison, uh, such as a ban on having cell phones. Um, in the, um, uh, and in the last two years, that you have uh, some 10,000 foreign ISIS men and women and children, they remain in a state of limbo. Uh, governments, uh, for the most part, and there are significant exceptions, but for the most part, have refused to take their citizens back, sometimes making the arguments too dangerous to send diplomats or military personnel in northeast Syria to extract their citizens. But I think the important point is, this situation serves the interest of both the governments and of the Kurds. Western governments are quite happy to have the Kurds imprison citizens that, for good reason, they see as dangerous. Again, every adult that went to Syria went to join a terrorist organization, but for whom evidence to convict may be hard to come by back home. And of course, it's the great convenience that you have the Kurds uh, who pay the cost of guarding and caring for the prisons. Uh, it's pretty expensive to incarcerate somebody in Denmark. It costs much less to have a Danish citizen incarcerated in northeast Syria. You know, the men, 20 or 30, or I, uh, Natasha was saying, uh, where one of the prison cells she visited, there were 100 people in the cell. Um, I, the ones I saw were somewhat smaller, but um, you know, that, that's much less difficult than having your own cell or um, I, I think what the mass murderer in Norway has, a three-room a three -room suite with his own TV and that sort of thing, Anders Breivik. Um, so uh, the arrangement, though, has advantages for the Kurds. Why? The Kurds are desperate for any form of international recognition, and the fact that they hold so many ISIS fighters and family members keeps the United States and Western countries engaged. Further, the Kurds um, are very concerned about their international reputation. They want to be thought of as champions of human rights. Uh, anybody who's been there know that the, the, the source of great pride is women's rights, strict gender equality in all government positions, military positions, um, so that they would like to deflect. They, they can deflect any criticism of them for holding people without trial by saying, no, 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 we're, we're asking governments to take back their people. And again, it's convenient for the government. So what has to understand is that this situation has served the purposes of both sides, but it is not sustainable. More than half the ISIS family members in Northeast Syria are children. They have committed no crimes but they're held in prison with their mothers. These camps, and I think you could see from the video, are miserable places. Freezing cold in winter, stifling hot at this time of year, uh, minimal health care, no real schooling, and worse, particularly in Al-Hol camp, they are dominated by the most radical ISIS women uh, who are raising their own children, and sometimes the children of women who have become disillusioned with ISIS, of which there's a significant number, they're raising their own children to be the next generation of jihadis, suicide bombers, rapists, and murderers. And none of this is in the best interest of the child, and of course, not for anyone else. Barring, and, and here I, I take some exception to what uh, Thomas has said, the truth is that barring 
A major change in the situation in northeast Syria, the ISIS men and women could well remain in their respective prisons forever. There's no guarantee that they're going to come, get out and get back to Europe. They may well, in fact, I think it's quite likely, they will die there. Um, but this needs not be true for the children and should not be true. Almost all governments are willing to take back their children. The Syrian Kurds, however, have been unwilling to forcibly separate children from their mothers for fear, for fear of being criticized by international organizations and humanitarian organizations. Um, I want to stress that they have been willing to allow mothers to send their children out. Uh, I have brought out three German children where the mother wanted to send her children out without her because Germany is one of the moral leaders of the free world. Uh, uh, at the last minute, they said they wouldn't object if the mother came, and so I was also able to bring the mother out. Most recently, in March, I brought out a Canadian child whose mother wanted the child to go and be with the aunt because that gave the child a future, but the mother couldn't come. In any event, uh, in circumstances where uh, uh, governments are unwilling to get, get their children, it, it, uh, you know, we need to think about a change of strategy. I mean, it's fine to be lobbying, and I'm, I'm glad there's been success in Denmark and Belgium and maybe Sweden, uh, Germany, but we have to recognize that for the most part, countries who are going to take their citizens have already done so. And uh, 14 Danish children, again, is, it, it's, uh, it's the Danish children, but it's a small part of the total number of children. So it's time for a, a change of strategy. And while it is true that mothers should not be forcibly separated from their children, that that is something that's bad for the child, bad for the mother, it's, it's a human rights violation, potentially. It is an even greater human rights violation to keep children in prison. And as long as governments refuse to take back the mothers, the refusal to separate children from their mothers represents a potential life sentence for the child. Now, human rights and inter humanitarian organizations have responded by calling for governments to take back their children, and some, as I've, we've noted, notably the United States, Finland, Denmark, uh, Netherlands, have, are beginning to do or so have so. But other countries will never repatriate their children. France is a case in point. And I, I have to say, the position of governments, even if you disagree with it, and I know everybody here disagrees with it, but I think you, you know, one of the things about diplomacy is you need to put yourself in the other person's shoes to understand their perspective. And their position is not unreasonable. It's understandable. Many of the prisoners, certainly the men, some of the women, have committed horrific crimes while with ISIS, but evidence is hard to come by. ISIS returnees, people who went to Syria and came back, have been involved in horrific crimes in Europe, including attacks in Belgium and France that killed hundreds. Not unreasonably, the French government has chosen to prioritize the safety of innocent citizens over those who joined a terrorist organization. Um, you know, uh, perhaps it's not unreasonable to say people who attend a concert ought not to be prone to an attack uh, because we've decided to bring back terrorists from Syria. Terrorists who, again, may never come back under these circumstances. So it's understandable. I'm not saying it's correct. I'm just putting myself in the other side's shoes. Uh, but the point is, in some countries, France is a case in point, they are never going to change their position. And we haven't talked, incidentally, about the countries where most of these children are from, in North Africa, South Asia, uh, they aren't taking their people back at all. Uh, so to have a strategy that simply says government should take back their people 
When they won't is no strategy at all. Uh, so what, what do we do? Um, again, the, the, the problem is minimal health care, sanitary dis conditions that are beyond disgusting, prisons run by the prisoners uh, who are radical, and incidentally, when children reach puberty, countries, then be, countries that are willing to take back children become unwilling to take them. Uh, the Kurds have a program uh, uh, for teenage boys, a uh, Uhuri house, they, the, the, to de-radicalize them. They, they are taken out, they go to this program, uh, they spend four years, you know, 14 to 18 in the program, de-radicalized, and you know what happens to them after they graduate? They go to prison, because there's no place else for them to go. They, they cannot be put in the local society. They're 18, their countries aren't going to take them back. Uh, so this is an argument simply for doing what is possible now. Um, uh, and again, um, uh, what would a new strategy entail? First, it should be based on international law and human rights law. And here, the rule is very simple. The United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child, which basically reflects both customary international uh, law and the law as applied in every country is, uh, is, is, uh, in the world, in every Western country, you apply one legal standard. You do what is, best what is in the best interest of the child. Normally, it's in the best interest of the child to remain with her parents, or in this case, her mother. But there are exceptions in every country. Countries remove children from their parents when the parents are abusive, or where the parents are living in an environment that is harmful to the child. And every Western country considers it harmful for a child to be in prison and therefore takes a child away from a mother or father who is incarcerated, who is in prison, even if the person is in prison, the parent, while awaiting, child, awaiting trial. You do not, in, in our countries, you do not put children in, in jail with their mothers. Um, and in most of our countries, this is automatic. It's certainly a human rights violation to a prison a person, a ch and especially a child, when that person has committed no crime. And as bad as it is to take a child away from her mother, it is even worse to hold her in prison. And incidentally, I do not consider radical women raising their children to be terrorists to be good mothers, to be fit mothers. So, what would a new strategy involve? I would urge uh, that the Syrian Kurds be encouraged to remove children from the prisons, and therefore, from their mothers. I would urge the creation of a system of foster care and children's villages. Children's villages mo modeled on what happened with displaced children after World War II, the, 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 the Kinderdorfs, uh, which were set up for unaccompanied children after the uh, Second World War, where Syrian Kurdish families in the foster care system would look for the smaller children or where the, ch the uh, kinder villages would look after the older ones. The children could go to school, have access to health care, and most of all, not be confined to a prison run by hardened criminals. It goes without saying that Western countries should pay and pay gener generously for a system of foster care in kinder villages. And because systems of foster care and kinder villages do not exist in northeast Syria, NGOs with requisite expertise need to help set up the system. The cost isn't great. I estimated that a system of foster care, paying uh, subsidies to families that take a child, could actually cost about $2 million a year. Uh, and whatever the cost is, it would be far cheaper than having the children grow up to be the next generation of ISIS. Once the children are separated from their parents, it should be much easier to repatriate the children. In my experience, every government is willing to take back their children. Not willing to take back their parents, they're not willing themselves to separate children from parents, but where the child is separated, they're willing to take them back. This could be accomplished uh, quickly. 
Uh, time, though, is of the essence. As the children grow up radicalized in these prison camps, countries will become reluctant to take them back. France has the largest number of European nationals in Kurdish-run prisons and prison camps. It's very clear that France will never take back its nationals back. And President Macron has told the Kurds that he will only take children below a certain age. I don't remember exactly, but it might have been even nine. If too much time passes, there will be no children younger than nine to take back. Human rights organizations and international organizations have a key role to play in this process. As I've said, the Kurds are very sensitive to international opinion. They don't want to be accused of violating human rights. Human rights organizations need to focus on the reality that the choice is not between an ideal world, it is a choice among relative evils. And the reality is that holding children in prison possibly indefinitely, is an even greater human rights violation than taking them away from their mothers, again, all of whom, when we talk about the foreign women, committed at least one crime. It can feel morally correct to say that countries should take back their, their children, take back their citizens, even though as a matter of law, people are usually tried where they committed the crime and not back in their own country. But again, we can be morally correct, we can shout that. The reality is that most countries are not going to do that. And the consequence of a morally pure stand, the practical consequence, is to condemn many children to a lifetime of prison, deprivation, and possibly early death. So, and this is the, experience, the, the voice of a diplomat who served in quite a number of war zones, Bosnia, Croatia, uh, Afghanistan, Iraqi Kurdistan. I say it's quite, uh, East Timor, quite simply, don't let the best be the enemy of the good. Let's do whatever is necessary to repatriate the children. Thank you. Um, now, thank you for your, your speech. <clears throat> um, in some ways, it's, um, I believe in a Danish public, it's quite a radical idea, that you're a, a, quite a radical solution um, to uh, separate mothers from children. And um, so I'm, I'm just being curious now. Um, have you had this conversation with mothers? How do you... How do, you, how do you go to a mother and tell them you, you have to let your children well, go? Well, let me just put the question back to you as a noted journalist and observer of the Danish political scene. Mm -hmm. How does the Danish public feel about putting children in prison who've committed no crime, possibly to life sentences? Mm -hmm. Not good, that's, I, that's I, for sure. <clears throat> so wouldn't, perhaps you would agree with me that the problem is that the Danish public doesn't understand the actual choice here. And, and that's the actual choice. I'm, I'm not gratuitously favoring taking children from the mother. So I'm saying there, there's a, on a practical level, for many of the children, this is the actual choice. And again, remember, we're not just talking about, I mean, we're having a lovely conference about fewer than 1,000 European children, but there are more than 5,000 children in those camps. Um, so uh, that, that's, that's the issue. But just to, to state my question again, how, how do you do it? Have you had this conversation with mothers? What do you say? Well, well, but, but look, if you, if you go to court with a, when, when, when you're in court and, you're, and you have a mother who's abusive or uh, you know, uh, endangering her child, uh, do you say, okay, uh, we're going to take the child away from you? Is that okay? No. The, usually the mothers will say no. But nonetheless, the state will come in and do it because it's in the best interest of the child. And, and that's more or less the situation here. There, there are mothers, and I must say, it's the mothers um, who, in my view, care the most about their children, um, who are the ones who have been willing to send their children out. Um, you know, in, in some sense, and, and, and incidentally, at least in one case, it served the mother well. You know, I think she, it was like the judgment of Solomon, the fact that she was willing to send her children out then made her own government at the last minute decide she was a worthy person and they agreed to take her.
We are certainly talking about hard choices here. Um, you mentioned uh, the example of France a couple of times in your talk. Could you perhaps just elaborate a little bit about uh, why is it that we must understand that France is never going to take their foreign fighters back? The, the, French have, the, the, the French president has repeatedly said this. Uh, Fr French uh, public is totally against it. In, in France, you're, you're balancing the safety of people. You think of the attack on the Bataclan Uh, 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 concert, the safety of the population against, again, people who went to join a terrorist organization, their, their welfare. Um, I mean, the, the French government and opinion, uh, public opinion are totally against it. Mm -hmm. You have an election coming up next year, and um, the alternative to President Macron is uh, Marine Le Pen. And I don't think very many people think that she is going to take a more generous view towards the, the French detainees. Pro probably not. Yes. Um, I'm a bit curious about this um, black box in the Danish debate, which is um, the Kurdish government. Um, we are now having meetings between Danish representatives of the government and the Kurdish uh, locals trying to figure out a way to uh, get the children home safely and the mothers in some cases too. Um, it's, it's sort of a black box. Uh, what is it that um, Denmark has to deliver to get the children home safely? What is it that they want? Well, I, I think that's, <laughs> that's a, a very good question. Uh, for two years, the uh, 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 Autonomous Administration in Northeast Syria, that's the formal term for it, is saying countries should take back their, 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 their people mm -hmm. and, and definitely take the mothers with the children. All of a sudden, Denmark, and it's not just Denmark, there have been several other countries in this uh, 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 experience, said, okay, you're right, we'll do it. And they're now, oh, wait a minute. Um, uh, we're not uh, really willing to do it right now. Uh, so, uh, are we doing it wrong? Are we not talking no, to I don't the right people? Doing, we're, we're no, not, well, uh, th there may be an issue there, but I don't think you're doing it wrong. Uh, I think you have to understand what it is that the uh, Kurdish administration wants. It wants recognition, not as a separate state, but recognition of its existence. Uh, every time a diplomat comes to northeast Syria, That's a form of recognition. So, you know, there's a kind of a, 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 a political currency mm -hmm. uh, to all of this. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it keeps the world engaged for a people who are entirely dependent on their survival for inter international support. So it's an understandable tactic. Oh. So um, you weren't really optimistic about solving this problem. You're actually talking about we're going to see f f uh, people kept in uh, prisons uh, in, in northern eastern Syria perhaps for decades. Um, so no way we can change that. Well, I, I've described a way to change it for some mm. people, but if, again, if you it's, reject it's, the idea of saving those you can, yeah. I mean, let, imagine you're, you're on a sinking ship and there are a thousand passengers. Mm -hmm. You only have a lifeboat that could, can hold 100. Uh -huh. Do you say, aha, well, we can't take everybody, therefore we take mm -hmm. nobody? No. Mm -hmm. the, the, this is a question of, of the people we can get into the lifeboat, and we can get the children into the lifeboat. And, and, and the notion, I, I just want to be clear, the notion that these people will somehow make their way back to Europe and become a threat after they've been radicalized, it's possible. But, It's also quite possible that this area will revert to the uh, control of the Syrian government. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the Kurds are adamantly against the death penalty. They don't apply it. I think it's fair to say that the Syrian government applies it with a certain element of enthusiasm. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, if they end up in the hands of the Iraqi government and some of the uh, French women and men have, were sent to Iraq, they had 15-minute trials, death sentences. Mm -hmm. Uh, so there's